Here's the snap. Brenton rolling right. Goes to pass on the other. It's caught! It's caught! It's caught! Touchdown official! Knowles retake the lead! An all-access look at Florida State Athletics. He's tackled. Game over. Knowles are the champions of college football. Talman Smith with a tackle to bring down Mason. Celebrate Seminole! From the Seminoles.com Pond Center, high atop Doak Campbell Stadium, here's your host, Jonathan Shalasi. Welcome back to another Seminoles.com podcast. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Jonathan Shalasi alongside Tim Linnefeld. We appreciate you guys tuning in on the holiday as we are on the cusp of a rivalry game here, the Sunshine Showdown of Florida State and Florida. And this one is going to be a good one. But first, we want to look at the awards announced just recently. Aguayo named a finalist once again for the Lou Groza. And then Nick O'Leary, a Mackey Award uh, finalist as well. Yeah, man. Uh, and that's uh, that's great news for, for both those guys, obviously. Uh, both of them were, were well, uh, both of them were under consideration for those awards last year. Roberto Aguayo, of course, won it. And, uh, and Nick O'Leary was a finalist for the Mackey Award last year. Uh, just, you know, looking at it, uh, I haven't studied the kickers across the nation. Right. But, but given what Roberto Aguayo has accomplished, uh, given the fact that he's already won the award, uh, given the fact that I, I think if, 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 if there is such thing as a household name among college football kickers, uh, it is Roberto Aguayo. Uh, you got to think that he's the, uh, he's the favorite to, to win that award. And uh, a little note for you, would become only the second ever two-time winner of the Lee Lou Groza Award. And, uh, and the only other guy to have done it is Sebastian Janikowski. Yep. So that'd be kind of a neat little, little piece of Florida State trivia uh, for you there. So yeah, that'll be cool. I guess the, uh, the award show is, uh, is coming up now, man. The, uh, the end of the season is, uh, is fast upon us. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to believe. Yeah, uh, Tulane is the only other school that's won it twice. Uh, that was back in 2001 and 2012. Um, so pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, and, this, and he would be Florida State's fifth, I believe. Yes, Roberto. he would be. Or if he gets to fourth, well, fourth, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, well, he, third, I, well, third, third player, fourth or fifth, fifth time. Man, yeah. we're really struggling <laughs> with the math here. We're, we're not math guys, people. Well, they won it 98, 99. So that was Janikowski. 08, 13. And then hopefully so this would be this would be number five. Yes, of split among three and players. Right there we go. We got there it. There you go. <laughs> All right. All right. We we, we nailed it down. He's, so. I mean, when you look at his career, ninety three percent field goal kicker. Uh, he's never missed a PAT. He's had four fifty yard field goals, three of which have come this year. Uh, he's done some incredible things, and now add a game winning field goal to his resume. Yeah, man. It's 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 kind of funny. I remember talking to I want to say Dustin Hopkins about this a couple of years ago. And I think for for the longest time, uh, you know, Florida State just had this stigma about kickers, and obviously that had a lot to do with you know the wide rights and and then the uh, then the wide left and all that. It all had to do with you know stem from that Florida State Miami rivalry. And and I'm not saying that reputation isn't deserved, but when you look at it, you know, take a step back and look at it with an objective eye. Do Florida State has had some tremendous kickers come through here between Sebastian Janikowski, who by the way is still in the NFL. I believe he's the longest tenured uh, Seminole in the NFL right now. He's in his 15th season with the Oakland Raiders. Uh, Graham Gano is kicking in the NFL. Dustin Hopkins was there, and I, I think he's still trying to make a comeback. You know, he was a, he was a Groza Award finalist in 2012, and now Roberto Aguayo, who, who's you know on the verge of back to back, you know, being named the best kicker in the country. Uh, you know, that, I, I don't think there's a college program in the country that can match that uh, in terms of, of of their their history of kickers. So it's kind of funny, you know, the way things sort of uh, you know go back and forth between the perception and the reality. It is quite amazing. And, and speaking of unmatched, a lot of people say, you know, Jameis Winston is unmatched, but he was snubbed, really, I think. Uh, in this college football awards, he is not going to Orlando for the Home Depot Awards. Uh, last year, up for three or four awards there, and this year, none. Yeah, it, it's kind of, I was surprised by that, uh, especially, again, given that, you know, the kind of the, the, the sweep that he had last year and the fact that, that you know, I, I still think if you watch him, you, you'll see that he's playing at a, an extremely high level. But, but you know, th- this season has been different for Jameis. Uh, you know, part of, you know, his, part of his numbers taking a dip is the fact that he didn't play in a game. Right. Uh, and then, you know, on the other side of it is, is, is just that, I don't know, it just seems like sort of like the, the highlights, the, the wow plays that we saw so, so often last year. You know, there were some against Bethune-Cookman and, and some against Clemson and some against Pittsburgh. You know, some of those like sort of eye-popping Sports Center mm-hmm. top ten plays. We haven't really seen as many of those. And, and I think, and, I, and I've, I've asked Jimbo Fisher about this a couple times, I think that's actually 
a result of uh, of him playing better in a lot of ways, or him playing smarter in a lot of ways. You know, not holding on to the ball as as long, uh, taking a check down instead of just chucking it deep. Uh, and, and as a result, if you don't hang on to the ball as long, you, you don't maybe have two or three pass rushers to spin out of. Right. Uh, and and if you if you're checking it down, you know, to a running back or or a, a shorter route, you're not throwing it 50 yards down the field to to somebody who happens to make a spectacular catch. Now, not to say those plays don't have a have, have a place, but but overall, I think Jimbo Fisher is probably happier with the way Jameis has played this year than ever before. Well, still undefeated. I think that's all that really matters to them. Uh, now let's uh, shift to the Sunshine Showdown, Florida State and Florida going Say at it. Say that three times fast. Yeah, that's a tough one, too. You know, it goes right along with the math that we were trying to do. Math, words, <laughs> what, 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 could, what can we do? <laughs> Apparently nothing. <laughs> but you look at it, and this is going to be a, a, you know, first let's focus on Florida's defense. They're, they're a good defense. Eighth opponent ranked in the nation's top 40 in total defense. It's the third straight year that they had ranked in the top 10 in total defense. They're at 11 right now. Uh, a pretty good defense. You look at Fowler. You look at their cornerbacks, their linebackers are good. This is going to be a good test for Florida State again. I think so. What would you say is the, the eighth top 40 defense that Florida State has played this year? Yep. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, in every one of those games, uh, Florida State has, has, has had an offensive output that exceeded that opponent's average for – for the season, so that's that's a little something to maybe feel good about while you're warming up your uh, your uh, your plate of leftovers this afternoon. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, man, no, I do think I think Florida is is a, a very very good defense. I think you know especially you know last year and this year uh, they're the reason that. While Florida's offense struggled at times, uh, the, the Gators were still able to win, you know to win some games. I think you saw it, you know, especially I think where they beat Kentucky, ten, or excuse me, beat Tennessee ten to nine, mm -hmm. uh, beat L, or they lost LSU by a pretty low score that, that you know kept them into the 30, into the game. Um, maybe not as low. Um, I'm probably mixing up my SEC games, but but the point being that you know Florida's offense hasn't been spectacular by any stretch over the last two seasons, but their defense has been really really good. I think it starts up front with the guy you mentioned, Dante Fowler, uh, a defensive end who is uh, you know really uh, an all-American caliber, NFL caliber player, uh, and that's going to be, I think, a, a, a real, a real matchup to watch. Is is Dante Fowler, the uh, the junior defensive end, going up against FSU's freshman left tackle Roderick Johnson? Uh, that's going to be, you know, I think Roderick Johnson has played really, really well over the last handful of games uh, that, that he's gotten some action. But uh, but this is going to be his biggest test by far. Oh, absolutely, and and then to the secondary as well. You know, they have a cornerback that is second in the SEC in most pass breakups. Uh, they don't allow too many deep passes. Uh, they allow just opponents 311 total yards per game. Um, so this is, you know, all around. And then you, you flip to their linebackers. Uh, Morrison leads the team with 93 tackles. So, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere across this field, they're pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And, and you mentioned the secondary. I think, you know, Vernon Hargraves is a, is a really, really, really nice player. Uh, Jimbo Fisher was asked, uh, you know, the other day if he's the best cornerback they'll have gone against, and he didn't quite go that far, but he, he said that he's as good as anybody they played, and they, there, aren't, there aren't many better. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what they kind of do with him. You know, is, is, is Hargraves going to just shadow Rashad Green? Uh, is he going to try to take away a certain side of the field? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know, you know, kind of what, what to expect from that. I, I do know we've seen that, that by and large, you know, just sticking your best defender on Rashad Green and hoping for the best usually isn't a recipe for success. But I also think that Vernon Hargraves is, is a better defender than, than the typical cornerback that Florida State has seen this this year. And, and you know, you remember uh, that last season in Gainesville, even, uh, you know, with, with, a, with an offense that featured, you know, Kelvin Benjamin, Kenny Shaw, Devontae Freeman, those guys, uh, you know, Florida State's offense didn't, didn't uh, come out in high gear right out of the gate. It took a little while to get going. It took a little while to, to break free because I think what you saw was those, uh, those DBs played – a really physical game, you know. There, there was some, some, some bumping at the line. Really, really, you know, there's a little bit of pushing and shoving, honestly, and then a little bit of clutching and grabbing downfield. That, you know, you know, honestly, they could get away with. And, and you know, Florida State fans don't like it, but the fact of the matter is, a, a, a savvy defensive back is going to figure out what he can get away with and take it right up to that line. And, and up to the, you know, for the first, you know, going to that game, um, you know, they were successful with it. And then, you know, we all saw Kelvin Benjamin decided to be Kelvin Benjamin and, and had just a, uh, an all timer of a game with, you know, more than 200 yards. And, and three touchdowns. So they, they figured it out, and I think that's going to be kind of a key for Florida State's offense. You know, R Rashad Green has been through this before. Nick O'Leary has been through this before. But I do wonder, you know, or, or Travis, R Travis Rudolph and Irmon Lane, you know, if, if they get popped at the line of scrimmage by a DB, are they going to respond? You know, are they going to get frustrated if, if a guy's maybe tugging on their jersey or clutching their shoulder pads if they're trying to break on a route? Are they going to be able to, to, you know, fight through that and play through that and respond to it? And, and if they can, I think it bodes pretty well for Florida State's passing attack. Well, then, to, to my question, then, is 
you know, how big is this running game for Florida State? How big of a game do, do these running backs have to have? You look at Dalvin Cook averaging 6.6 .6 yards per carry. You know, he's right there with Miami's Duke Johnson for highest average in the ACC, um, in the top 10 rushers in the conference, and has as many touchdowns as well. But, you know, how important is it going to be for him, for Carlos Williams to get their run game going to maybe spread this this thing out and allow the passing game to be there? Well, I, I think that's kind of that's the, that's the key, you know, Every week, if you can, you, you, what you don't want to do is be is be one dimensional uh, in any sense. And that's, you know, even if you have a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback and, and, and five legitimate receiving targets, uh, you still want to be able to keep defenses honest. And, and, and yeah, that's uh, that's going to be a big part of it. And, and again, man, I think that's, you know, where you're going to look at that offensive line against that that def the, you know that front seven for Florida. Um, you know, it starts like again with you know with, with Roderick Johnson and Dante Fowler, but you know Florida's got athletes across the board up there. Uh, it's going to be a big test for. Uh, I mean, it's going to be a test for Cameron Irving at center. You know, he's still playing a new position there and, and still having to deal with you know some of the changes that come with that. And and this I think will easily be the the best defensive line that he's faced as a center. Uh, so yeah, man. I mean, it, it's a time when you know you'd really like to to lean on you know some of your veterans. You know, like Trey Jackson, Josue Matias, Bobby. Hart, uh, and Cam, you know, guys that have sort of been through these types of games, been through the, these physical battles, and, and hope that they can they, they can hold their own. Well, you talked about Rashad Green earlier um, as one of the wide receivers that, you know, have been here and have done this. If he has a game quite like Benjamin did, uh, he will break the ACC career receiving yards. He's just 137 away. So all he's got to do is go for two, 200 yards and three touchdowns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know that he'll get 212 uh, touchdowns or 212 yards, uh, but if he gets 137, he'll break the record. Yeah, well, it's on the table. He's he's had that before uh, this season, and 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 yes, and if and if not this week, you got to think you know in the next two weeks is a a pretty good uh, a pretty good likelihood of happening. So, yeah, man, uh, you know you can't can't say enough about Rashad. You know we uh, had the story run on the site um, earlier this uh, earlier this week, I guess. Uh, Yesterday, depending on when you're uh, when you're listening to this podcast, ran on Thanksgiving Day, and uh, and yeah, man, it just I, I think you know if you look at his career and what he's been able to do, I think he, he certainly deserves the uh, the records and, and all the accolades that come with him. I don't think he really cares if he has them. I, mean, I think you know you like to have them, but I don't right. I don't think that's what he came here to set out to do. But but yeah, I think that you know having a big game against Florida in in a game that you know let's face it, I mean you know as far as undefeated 11-0 teams go, I mean Florida State has to have this one. Uh, I think having a nice game uh, in, in that uh, in that contest, the rivalry and all that, would uh, really be a nice little exclamation point, uh, you know, toward the end of his career. Well, he's going for the trifecta as well at Florida State. Five more touchdowns. He'll have the all-time record uh, for touchdowns in a career. Uh, he's already passed the receptions, the receiving yards. Uh, he's just going for the touchdowns now. That would be quite something to have the trifecta. For What's he one. need? Five more for that? Five more. He'll break it. Four more. He ties Peter okay. Warwick. Um, but, you know, it, again, another good test for Florida State's offense um, when you look at it. Now, flip side for the defense, this is going to be a good test for them as well because you look at what they did against Boston College. They allowed the Eagles to, to run all day. They, they ran 51 times. Um, and now, you know, Florida comes in and they'll be doing the same thing. Yeah, you know, they're, they, it's not the exact same style, so to you know, speak. The way, the way they line up and, and the, way they, the way that they, they run is a little bit different. Uh, but, but the end result, the goal is the same, is that they want to you know, chew up yards, control the clock, limit possessions. And, and I think, you know, quite frankly, I think, I think Boston College, you know, sort of had, they had the blueprint for, you know, if you're going to beat Florida State, the key, I think, is to keep their offense off the field because the longer they're on the field, the more they're getting in rhythm, the more dangerous they can be. And, and you know, you've seen it at, at, at times, you know, at, at against Notre Dame or against Louisville or against Miami. You know, they, they, they can sputter a little bit early on, and then by about that fourth, fifth, sixth possession, uh, and sometimes sooner, you know, they start clicking and, and they can go down the field, you know, in, in moments. Uh, against BC, you know, Florida State only had nine possessions. Uh, and, and, that, and that's not a lot. And then, you know, factor in also the, uh, the, the driving rain and the wind, and it really kind of kept, uh, kept the offense under wraps. Uh, we expect the weather to be nice on Saturday, but we also expect, I think, for Florida to run the ball a lot. And, and they've, been, they've been really, really good at that. They've, uh, they've averaged about 240 yards rushing per game over their last uh, five contests, four or five contests. Now, part of that is 
due to the fact that they ran for more than 400 yards yeah. against Georgia. So that spikes your average pretty significantly. Okay, <laughs> well, that's fine, except the fact that 400 yards is still 400 yards. Yes. And when you do it in a single game against, I think, easily the most impressive team in that, that little run, I think it included uh, Georgia, South Carolina, Eastern Kentucky, and Vanderbilt. Uh, you know, Georgia's the best team of that group, and Florida ran for 400 yards. So while it skews the average pretty heavily, I don't think you can just discount 400 yards rushing. No, 418 total against Georgia. They rank near the top of the SEC by averaging, like you said, close to 200 yards per game. They've rushed for over 200 in five, five games this year. So yeah. So almost half their games, they've rushed for 200 yards. Yeah, man, and, and you know, they've got, they've got a big back in Matt Jones, a, a, a smaller size back in Kelvin Taylor, and then Treon Harris, the freshman quarterback, you know, he can run it as well. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out if, if, if Florida is a, a poor man's Boston College or Boston College is a poor man's Florida in terms of what I expect them to do. Because I think, I think Florida is going to run the ball. They, they average about 45, 46 rushing attempts per game. Boston College ran 51 times or 52 times. Times, uh, over the 50s, uh, and and you know they, they're they're content to you know grind it out, pick up three, four, five, six, maybe, you know seven yards a play, uh, seven yards a run, and I think I think that's what we're going to see, man. You know, you know Treon Harris, uh, I think is a really nice player, but they don't ask him to throw it very much. Uh, it's it's not uncommon at all for him to finish in single digit passing attempts. I think against Eastern Kentucky, he was something like four for 12 passing. So that's not really part of their game plan. Uh, so yeah, man, I think you know Florida State, you know, to bring a lunch as it goes because it's going to be tough. It's going to be physical, and, and I do think Florida is going to be, you know, pretty motivated to, to send their coach, Will Muschamp, out as a, a winner in this rivalry. We're going to get on that in a second because there's a lot of motivational factors in this game. Uh, but back to Harris real quick. You know, again, he was recruited by Florida State. He had committed, and then he goes to Florida, um, and he's been their starting quarterback for, for quite some time now, halfway uh, for the last third of the season for dress, uh, Jeff Driscoll. Uh, but, you know, we saw with Miami, we knew they were going to run, run, run. But then I don't know that we expected them to pass that as much. Do you see maybe Florida doing that as well? You know, Florida State preparing for the run, 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 expecting maybe 50 runs, uh, you know, carries a game. But do you see maybe them switching things up and having Harris actually throw it? Well, you know, I, I'm still kind of perplexed about Miami's game plan in the second half uh, and the way they, they were sort of doing things. You know, I thought Kaya played pretty well. Uh, but, but I, you know, Duke Johnson didn't get the ball nearly as much as I thought he would in that second half. And I think part of that was, you know, he was having issues with cramps and, 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 and couldn't in the game, but uh, you know, that's part of it. Uh, I don't know, man. Again, I, I think Florida is going to come in here and run the ball. I think two years ago when, when, when Florida came in and beat Florida state, the last team to beat Florida state, uh, two years ago, they, they, they won that game by controlling the line of scrimmage. You know, the Florida's offensive line, that game, uh, you know, really got the best of Florida state's defensive line. They, they just did, um, and so, you know, I, I think that's going to be what their game plan is. I think, that, again, they're going to run around the ball. And, and I think if, if, you're, if you're coming out and asking Treon Harris to throw 20, 25 times, uh, that's not where Florida wants to be. Uh, and if, if the stat line ends up that way, I, I, you know, I, I, would, I would wager that you could, you could look at that and, and see, kind of get an idea for what the final score was before you even, before you even read it, because I just don't think that plays into Florida's strengths at all. Well, and I think it goes to your point, again, is keeping Florida State's offense off the field, and if you keep throwing it that much, you're not going to keep them off the field. Right, right. Uh, now, you had hinted on, you know, emotions. Again, Will Muschamp's last game as coach. Uh, it's a rivalry game. But on the flip side, Florida State, last home game for these seniors – uh, the last time that they lost was Florida, and these true seniors have never beat Florida inside Doe Campbell Stadium. Yeah. So the emotions play a big part. What have you know? When I'm talking to the players, you know, it, it seems that the emotions are going to be high, but they got to put it behind them. We've seen them be able to do it. Do you expect the same? Of course, of course. And, and look, man, you know, uh, rivalries and emotions and, and heated feelings and all that kind of stuff, man. That's what makes this stuff fun, you know. We talked about talked to Reggie Northrup, who's from Jacksonville, which is a pretty heavy Gator town, and he said that you know he always grew up hating Florida. He hates their colors, hates the fans, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and obviously, he doesn't really hate them, but it's, it hates them in the context of college football. And then you know uh, the same with Carlos Williams yesterday talking about that. He you know, he grew up in in sort of Central Florida area, which can really kind of go either way. He said uh, he told us last night that the only uh, the only thing he likes about orange and blue is the Powerade. <laughs> so you know stuff like that. And, and look, you know I think you know Florida says the same thing. I think they had a kid come out and say, uh, you know, last week or earlier this week, he was asked about 
uh, you know, Florida State's winning streak, and he said, oh, we're going we're gonna to end that. You don't have to worry about that. And, and you know what, man? I mean, whatever. People get all up in arms about that sort of thing and, and bulletin board material and, and trash talk and all that. But isn't that kind of what makes this sport fun? Like, this, does, does somebody saying that, oh, I don't like this, this rival team and their fans, does that make Florida want to beat Florida State more? Right. No, man. It's a football game against your in-state rival. Like, they, they, they want to win. You know, then that, that's kind of the, the way it goes. So I, that's kind of, sorry, a little, little bit of a mini rant there. But I, I really enjoy, uh, you know, seeing the kind of the emotion and the, and the colorful side uh, that, that comes out in these, these rivalry games. And I, I think it's definitely good for the sport. I think it's what makes college football really unique. Yeah. Well, last season, Florida State came into Gainesville and whooped them 37-7 to behind, you know, Kevin Benjamin, that big game that he had. Uh, you know, again, you know, a big rivalry game. How do you see this one? playing out this year. Last year, a lot of people said it was going to be close. It was a 37-7 ball game. This year, it's close again. Do you expect last year's performance, or do you expect something even closer? I don't think it's going to be 37-7. to no. uh, I don't <laughs> expect Florida State to win this by four touchdowns. Uh, man, you know, I, I, it's going to be interesting. Again, I, I think Florida's defense is really good, but I think Florida State's offense is, is also really good, and, and it goes back to kind of the – the same, uh, the same thing that we've been saying. I think we said it a couple days ago on the, on the previous podcast. Is just given the amount of weapons that Florida State has, I think they're really, really tough to stop for 60 minutes. Uh, I, I don't know that you can do it, but you, you know, if, if Rashad Green is on his game, if Travis Rudolph is on his game, and Nick O'Leary is on his game, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what you do about those three guys, while also, you know, putting the guys up front that you need to, to have to be able to slow down Carlos Williams and, and especially Dalvin Cook. Uh, and the running game, you know, if, if, if Florida is able to stop the run with just their just their defensive line, it could be tough for Florida State. But, I, I you know, we haven't really seen uh, anybody do that just yet, at least not consistently. Uh, and, and then, you know, there's there's the Jameis Winston factor. Uh, you know, he's he's played really well in big games. He's played well when his team has needed him to. And uh, and again, I think and, and what I expect, I think will be I think it will be close, but I think Florida State will win. And I think win reasonably comfortably. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously Jameis Winston being who he is is kind of the, the swing factor in that. Well, to your point about the running backs, Dalvin Cook, one in every 12 carries he gets, he breaks off at least a 20-yard run. And for Jameis Winston, he'll be the first quarterback um, in quite some time since 1954, the 1956 season, he'll be the first quarterback to win uh, 25 straight games, be 25-0. and 0 in a career, so uh, a lot on the line. Who was the last, who was the last uh, Florida State quarterback to start 2-0 and against Florida, I wonder? We'd have to look that up. Who would that have been? Let's, 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 play, let's play this game real quick. It's probably well, in the notes somewhere. But, okay, so it wasn't E.J. Manuel. Nope. No, it wasn't Christian Ponder. Nope. It wasn't Drew Weatherford. Nope. It wasn't any of those guys, or never Ricks or any of those guys. Right. Um, Ricks would have won. He Ricks would have won out of two, uh, 2002 and 2003, but they, they lost the first game. I guess Chris Winkie would have done it. Chris Winkie would have done it. So, been a while since we've had that. Yeah. So, uh, throw, throw that on the, uh, on the ledger for, uh, for Jameis Winston. Well, you did that pretty quick. Well, you know, I, I had to think about it. So, so Winky was a starter in, in 98. Well, wait, wait, hang on. No, yeah, yeah. So, you didn't play against Florida in 98, but he, he started against him in 99 and 1 and started against him in 2001. So, Chris so. Winky's last, last Florida State quarterback to start 2 0 against Florida. So it's how been about quite that? some time. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. 14 years. Yeah. So, so. I, I, I would have guessed longer. But. Yeah. No, um, some good stuff there. Um, and Florida State and Florida will go at it at 3.30. Uh, that game is on ESPN. It's another sold-out crowd. Florida State has sold out uh, Doe Campbell Stadium. Every game this year is the first time in school history since they've moved to a capacity of 82,000 uh, inside Doe Campbell Stadium. Now, uh, that is not the only sport going on nope. this weekend. Um, Busy weekend. We're looking at two games here Friday. Uh, volleyball, their last game of the regular season. They're looking to host at home. Uh, for the NCAA tournament, the first two rounds. Uh, soccer at home, they're in the Elite Eight. Uh, they've made it there every year under head coach Gregorian. Uh, they're playing South Carolina, though, who is a team that beat Florida, who defeat is the only team to, to win beat FSU. over at Florida State. And they defeated North Carolina, who did not lose to Florida State this year. They tied them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, two big wins for the South Carolina team that's coming in. It's going to be a good test for Florida State, who's trying to go to the Final Four for the fourth straight time. Yeah, man. Uh, and, and, again, I, I think it's what the, the remarkable consistency that, that Mark Corian has brought to that program. Uh, you know, truly, you know, I, you know, soccer doesn't get enough credit, you know, on the, on the national landscape. But just playing at that high of a level every single year, year in and year out, I think kind of transcends 
what sport you play. And so it should be a lot of fun there tonight. You know, soccer always gets a big a big following, especially for for a game like this one. And and yeah, man, I think you know uh, South Carolina is tough. You know, I guess I, I'd be lying if I said I knew uh, an awful lot about them. But you see the uh, <laughs> you see the teams they've beaten. Obviously, beating Florida catches your attention. attention. Beating North Carolina certainly catches your attention. So you know you know that they didn't get here by some fluke. They uh, they paid their dues to uh, to make it there. So uh, so I'm sure that uh, that they'll they will uh, they'll, they'll bring bring something for uh, for Florida State to uh, to really kind of chew on tonight. But uh, but it should be fun. Yeah, 2 o'clock kick for that. And then you have a tip-off at 6 p.m. inside the Donald L. Tucker Center of Florida State uh, on the heels uh, of a victory over Citadel. Uh, you know, they play again here today at, at 6 o'clock. Yeah, man. And uh, and I think the the thing to me is is we're looking at Xavier Rathen Mays. Is, is he going to keep this up? He's been on a really just a really nice hot streak over the last couple of games. He scored, I think, what, 22 in the loss to UMass. Um, and then, you know, obviously the 26 against the Citadel the other night where uh, he was 8 of 9 from the field, 5 of 5 from three-point range, and 5 of 5 from the free throw line. And it goes without saying, you know, obviously, you know, uh, Leonard Hamilton said he doesn't expect – Xavier Rathen may is to, to do that every night, and, and certainly not. But, man, if he can do anything even resembling that on a consistent basis, uh, it could be a, a real you know, a difference maker for, for, for this basketball team, uh, especially you know, if and when uh, Aaron Thomas and, and Devin Booker get back from, uh, from their various ailments. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think you know, if, you're, if you're Florida State basketball, you're, you're a little disappointed with starting two and three, but there's also you know, some things coming down the pipe uh, that, that you uh, certainly have to feel optimistic about. Absolutely. So a lot going on. 1 o'clock for volleyball, 2 o'clock for soccer, 6 o'clock for basketball. Man. Then you have the block party, Sam Hunt, a big uh, performance here in Clayman Plaza. I want to go out and see him. And then one of your favorite things tomorrow before the game, again, the kickoff for Florida State football, 3.30. You love the sod talks. Charlie oh, Ward's yeah. going to be there. Yeah, man. So that'll be, that'll be at 1.30. Uh, I guess they do that it's two hours before kickoff. Yeah, man, that's a, that's a really cool thing. If, if, if you haven't gone out there yet, I, I do recommend it. Uh, especially for somebody like Charlie Ward, uh, you know the, the whole deal with that is uh, is the, you know they bring back former players to talk about the sod games they played in, and, and if applicable, uh, talk about sod games against that day's opponent. And, and Charlie Ward certainly played in a, in a memorable game at Florida in 1993, which is a sod game, and, and I'm sure he'll have some uh, some good stories good stories to share about that game, that that crowd, that atmosphere, and and of course that famous uh, little swing pass to Warwick Dunn that, that sealed the game and, and FSU's appearance in the national national championship game. So yeah, man, that'll be a yeah, that'd be really cool. It was uh, it was funny. I'll, I'll share a little story with you with you guys uh, before we go. If you follow me on Twitter, you might have already seen this. But uh, so we were here against, uh, or it was after the Boston College game, and I was I was heading down the elevator to the field, and uh, I'm, I'm walking down the hallway, and I look behind me, and there's Charlie Ward, and uh, he's wearing like an FSU hoodie and a hat. And then if if you know, like Charlie Ward is about the most just unassuming guy you've ever met in your life. Like he doesn't carry himself like a famous athlete. He he doesn't really look, you know, to be quite honest, like a like a famous athlete. Right. Like he's not super super built. He's not super tall or anything like that. Just just absolutely no reason to uh, to to think that you know there's anything especially remarkable. And I and I and I, and I don't mean that as an insult at all. I just mean like you know usually when you're when you're in close encounters with or close encounters with a with an athlete, you can kind of tell. Uh, with him, you certainly can't. So uh, so we get in this elevator on the ninth floor, and so we're going down nine floors uh, from from the press box to uh, to the field, and of course it's after the game, so the the elevator is just loaded up. So so he gets on. It's me. It's Charlie Ward. And about, I don't know, how many people fit in an elevator? However many people can fit in an elevator. Another about maybe 10. 10, 15 Florida yeah. State fans, big-time Florida State fans. And a lot of them are coming from the, the booster's box and the president's box. So, so big Florida State fans. So we're in there. Nobody knows who he is. Nobody. Wow. Nobody knows, nobody knows they're riding an elevator with Charlie Ward. Which I thought was kind of funny, right? And, and, yeah. and, and I should also say that, that just given, given what I think anybody uh, knows about Charlie, um, is I think that's kind of the way he wants it. I, you know, he's happy to say hi, happy to sign autographs, happy to post for pictures. But, uh, but if, uh, you know, he's also uh, more than happy just to kind of, kind of blend into the crowd and, and sort of be, uh, be anonymous and keep to himself. So just kind of a, a funny little story there for, uh, for people. I thought that was, uh, was kind of cool. That, that is pretty that, funny. You know, one of the, uh, the legends of the program can, uh, can still, you know, kind of keep to himself at a football game. Well, come out to the sod talk and find out who you'll he know, is. You'll know who he <laughs> is then. You'll know who he is then, that's for sure. <laughs> well, it's going to be a great day today. Soccer, volleyball, basketball, tomorrow, football. Uh, enjoy the weekend. We will come back to you next weekend with a recap of this game, and hopefully Florida State will be undefeated for another regular season. So, again, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Enjoy Black Friday, and we'll come to you next week. Thanks so much for joining us.